Hello, Nocturnist listeners. It's Emily. In case you missed last week's episode, we are back. We're picking up where we left off with season three of our podcast last spring. Just so you know, these stories and conversations were recorded back in 2019, before the events of 2020 upended our lives. So listen with that context in mind. Today is Giving Tuesday. What better way to support the healthcare community and storytelling than by making a donation to The Nocturnist? Visit thenocturnist.com slash donate for more information. Here's our show. At The Nocturnist, we are careful to ensure that all stories comply with healthcare privacy laws. Details may have been changed to ensure patient confidentiality. All views expressed are those of the person speaking and not their employer. A quick warning. This episode of The Nocturnist includes themes of mental health crises and suicidal actions. Listener discretion is advised. This is The Nocturnist, stories from the world of medicine. I'm Emily Silverman. Today, I talk to David Muller, an internal medicine doctor and the Dean for Medical Education at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York. What makes caring real, and not just something we do professionally? But first, we'll hear the story that he told about how he wound up trying to save a life outside the hospital. Here's David. So my story takes place on a hot, muggy Friday afternoon in August. Uh, It was the end of a long day. Actually, it was the end of a very long week. Um, And just to add some frame of reference, my my role, my work um, is in medical education. I'm dean for medical education at a medical school in New York City called Mount Sinai. We had spent the entire week prior to this Friday ramping up for orientation. When the incoming class of medical students come in and try to provide for them an experience entering medical school that would inspire them and kind of energize them for the journey ahead. Inspiration obviously is a tall order, especially for a room full of 140 people, and especially if you don't like public speaking. So the week was pretty stressful. It was actually more stressful than usual because that Friday, the same hot muggy Friday, was the one-year anniversary almost to the day of the death of one of our graduating students by suicide. She had died exactly a year ago, and her death had obviously shaken us, all of us, to our core. Uh, When she took her life, it was exactly the third day of medical school for that year's incoming class. And now, coming up on the anniversary and a new class, I really wasn't sure what I could possibly say to the incoming students in the wake of that tragedy. And so on that hot, muggy afternoon on Friday, I was commuting back home, and my commute is from... Mount Sinai, which is in Manhattan, to New Jersey, where I live. And it's a little bit unusual because it's a commute by bicycle. It's only 11 miles, even though you've got to cross a river and you've got to go over the George Washington Bridge. But the benefits are obvious. You get lots of aerobic exercise. There's no traffic. You don't pay the tolls. I don't have to worry about parking in Manhattan. I actually see lots of big sky and the entire length of the city every time I cross the bridge. So it's definitely worth it. So this Friday afternoon, I'm riding home, trying to leave the week's tensions behind, focusing my mind on getting home and unwinding and maybe even having that first cold beer. And if you've seen or been over the George Washington Bridge, you know that there are two huge towers and it's a suspension bridge. So you ride up this switchback and I'm passing the first tower, the one that's on the New York side. And just as I get past the tower, maybe 50 feet in front of me, there's a bicycle laying on its side on the pedestrian pathway where I'm riding. And my first thought was that someone must have fallen off of the bicycle. But almost in the same instant, since I'm still moving, I see someone standing closer to me than the bicycle on his cell phone um, and talking into it in a pretty animated way. I still can't make out what's happening. I've slowed down just a little bit when I saw the man and the bicycle. And then I realized that beyond the bicycle, there's another man standing and he's outside the rail. He's holding onto the rail with both hands behind his back. He's leaning way forward, almost like a diver, and staring straight down into the water. And it was jarring. Um, It was jarring in a way that something shocks you when it's simply not part of the natural order of things. I've been riding over the George Washington Bridge to work and back home for at least 20 years, and I've never seen anything on the other side of that rail but thin air. 
And the man that was standing there holding on uh, looked a little bit older than me. Maybe he was 60. Um, he looked a little bit disheveled. He had a full head of graying hair. He was wearing dark pants, a light-colored button-down shirt. That's really all I can remember from the image of him. And I froze. And the space on the pedestrian walkway is maybe 10 or 12 feet across. It's quite narrow. I was pretty close to him. At the same time, the wind on the bridge is always gusting. The bridge actually shakes and buckles as cars and trucks rumble past. You can barely hear yourself think. I was afraid to say anything to him. I was afraid of doing anything that might trigger him to let go. And the distance between us was quite small. But I had to do something. I started yelling at him and yelling because otherwise there's no way he would have heard me. I yelled kind of typical things that you might say. Are you okay? Can I help you? Which is kind of a stupid question to ask. Um, Do you want to climb back over to this side? I said these things a few times, but he didn't acknowledge me at all. He just kept staring ahead or down into the water. And after one more try on my part, he started yelling back. And when he yelled back, he said the kind of things you'd imagine hearing someone say on a ledge in the movies when they're about to jump off. Don't come near me or I'll jump. I really mean it this time. No one cares about me. They're not going to lock me up again no matter what happens. I won't let them take me like they did last time. And if I wasn't terrified already, I was now in full-blown panic inside. In my mind's eye, I saw him letting go, slowly disappearing from sight, if I said or did the wrong thing. I desperately did not want this man to die, and just as desperately did not want to have that image of him letting go engraved in my mind for the rest of my life. I'm a doctor, I yelled back. I won't let them take you to the locked ward. At this point, I was willing to say anything that would prolong our exchange, even if he still refused to look at me or acknowledge me. I also realized that as a couple of minutes have passed, people had accumulated around us maybe half a dozen runners or cyclists who were coming from either side of the bridge and stopped in their tracks, um, also terrified to cross our paths because they realized what was going on between the two of us. And so the next time he yelled, no one cares, I yelled back at him, yes, we do. Turn around and look at all these people who care about you. I realized that there was a crowd now staring at him. And it did the trick. For a moment he turned and made eye contact with me and he saw the people standing around him. But then he slowly turned back, and instead of the outcome that I was looking for, he started climbing down the outside of the rail to get out of our line of sight. So until that point, he was standing on the rail, holding on behind his back. And as he climbed down, I realized he was going to end up in a place where I couldn't tell what was happening anymore. I kept yelling, and at the same time, I was relieved to see flashing lights out of the corner of my eye coming from the New Jersey side. Within seconds, four New Jersey transit cops had climbed onto the walkway where I was standing, passed me, marched right up to him, and did what probably you're supposed to do in situations like that, which is demand that he get down immediately from the rail. They lifted him over the rail, handcuffed him, and marched him right past me. Just before they ducked his head to get in the patrol car, which was right in front of me, he looked up at me and said, I told you they were going to lock me up. At that point, the police left. The crowd dispersed. I got on my bicycle and I started riding home again, as if nothing had ever happened, except that my entire body was shaking. I felt myself erupting with emotions, the anxiety and the tension pent up inside of me. I felt like I had just saved someone's life, but I also felt like it didn't matter. I felt like I'd figured out the right things to say, maybe, but in the process I had lied to him about whether anyone on that bridge, including me, really cared. I'd fooled him into believing that there was some hope, some humanity. In reality, none of us cared enough to find out where he was being taken, what his name was, why he was so desperate to end his life, or what we could actually do to help him get his life back together. I spent the weekend worrying about how to reconcile that lack of genuine caring with what I do every day, caring for patients and caring about medical students. A week later, I was standing in an auditorium, in front of 140 newly minted medical students, still not sure what to say to them about the journey they had chosen to pursue. So I found myself telling them about a man who tried to kill himself on a bridge and asking them these very same questions. What makes caring real and not just something we do professionally? And if we happen to do it well because it's expected of us, is that really enough?
So I am talking to David Muller. David, thanks so much for being here with me today. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me here. So tell me about your path to medicine. My path to medicine? Um, my path to medicine is, I guess it is, I don't know if it's interesting, but it's unusual. I, um, my parents emigrated to this country when I was five, and I'm a first-generation college grad, so I didn't have a lot of guidance in applying to schools. I kind of randomly applied to maybe four or five, and uh, believe it or not, was rejected from all of them except for Johns Hopkins, and actually had no idea going into it that Hopkins had this reputation as being a, a pre-med mill. Um, and in the background of that, my mother, typical Jewish mother, had always told me that her father had said throughout his life, and even on his deathbed, that I would be a doctor one day. You know, she sort of had that myth floating around when we were kids growing up, but I never took it seriously. Um, and there I was at Hopkins, surrounded by pre-meds, and I just kind of got on the on the pathway. And that's how um, I ended up in medicine. It gets a little bit messier after that, but that's how I ended up in medical school. I'm so fascinated by this prophecy that your grandfather made on his deathbed. Where do you think that came from? Um, I, I don't know. It either came from the sort of typical, no matter where you came from, no matter what uh, social sphere or culture, being a doctor is kind of you know somewhere near the top of the social food chain in people's minds. So it either came from there or my mother entirely made it up. That's always possible in my <laughs> mind. That he, he never really said that and maybe never even thought it, but she really was determined to make sure that I pursued that pathway. So there's this moment in your story that really stuck with me, and it's the moment where you're on the bridge, you're worried about this guy, and he says to you, they're going to lock me up, and you say to him, I'm a doctor. I'm not going to let them lock you up. And then they do anyway. How did that feel? It didn't feel great when he kind of threw it back at me, kind of as an accusation. But I didn't feel bad about it at the moment because it, quote, it worked. The downstream impact of that, like where he ended up and all of the rest of it, was something that was, you know, a struggle to think about. You really went in the direction that I was hoping we'd go in, which is this question of, as doctors, do we ever lie to patients? And if so, is that ever okay? Sometimes I think that we bend the truth a little with patients. Like sometimes we frame things in a little bit of a different way to help the patient kind of wrap their mind around something. And then we sort of unpack the rest of the conversation and get them where they need to get to. Because we have, you know, we have so much information, right? You, you can't just dump all the data in the patient's lap and say, here you go, figure this out and let me know when you have any questions. You kind of have to walk them through the process. And sometimes it involves not entirely revealing everything that you know, you know, in bits and pieces, and you give them time to think it through. And that's not entirely the truth. Sometimes I have these situations where I have a million things to do, and I'll say to them, I'm not sure, I'll have to look into that and get back to you, and you know, I'll come back later, and I don't. And I feel badly about that, yep. and I realize you know, that that's not okay. I think we all do it, tiny little slip. Uh, I'll see you a little later today, <laughs> or I'll be back in a couple hours. But we know that we're not going to have the time to come back given everything else we have to do. The patients know that we're lying to them, and it does contribute to the mistrust that people feel. Just imagine laying there knowing that and then having to see that person again the next day and let them examine you and let them tell you what's going on and, and having to believe that what they've told you today is actually true, even though yesterday they said they're coming back and they never did. And, you know, we, I mean, we could easily convince ourselves that those little lies, a little bit of bending the truth is okay. But the reality is that, you know, people a generation ago would use the same rationale for telling people horrible lies. I remember as a resident having lots of examples of patients who came in who had no idea how sick they were, how dire the situation was, because their doctors, maybe with the best of intentions, maybe not, um had shielded them from the worst news or, you know, maybe protected them, but maybe just flat out didn't want to tell them and have to deal with the fallout. Uh, I saw that over and over again in training. Probably lots of people did. And so maybe we don't do that in the same way that previous generations did, but we have our own little truth-bending rituals. Yeah, I'm trying to think of a truth-bending episode that actually feels okay and feels good, and I'm just drawing a blank. <laughs> An example that does come to mind for me, and I think it's because of the home visits, you know, we, we, the vast majority of people we take care of, um, 
die at home. And there have been conversations, I think lots of them that I've had with patients about what it's going to be like when they die. And in order to have that conversation, I feel like I need to provide people with a lot of reassurance. Not, oh, it's going to be fine. It's a piece of cake. Don't worry about it. But we're going to make sure that you're comfortable and that this happens with dignity and it happens peacefully. And we absolutely do everything that we can to ensure that. But it also is the case that you you can't do that 100% of the time. It just doesn't work Mm -hmm. 100% of the time. So that's definitely a white lie or a truth-bending ritual, if you will, that I've used in order to try to keep people as um, calm and relaxed and trusting in the system when it's, it's evident they're not going to live for very much longer. One type of truth bending that's coming to mind as you're talking is the example of interacting with a patient who has dementia and maybe they're saying things like, oh, my son, this and that, and I just play along and I don't say Mm -hmm. things like, you know, actually your son is dead because I just don't find that helpful. I think it's better just to go along with it. What really the crux of your story brought up for me Mm -hmm. is this difference between pretending to care and actually caring. And last night I actually Googled the difference between caring and pretending to care. And I came across this article on WikiHow that was called How to Act Like You Care. (laughs) And it listed all of these different methods like active listening, saying encouraging words, repeating and paraphrasing what the other person said to demonstrate understanding, taking note of and considering what the other person likes and following through on that. And so I'm wondering, even if you don't actually really care in that moment, if you do all of those things on that checklist, like, is that caring? And I don't know, since you told the story, have you made any headway in answering that question? Um, no. <laughs> I, I mean, I can tell you what I think is that it, um, it's totally okay and it absolutely works. And, and to be clear, right, we're not talking about people who really don't care and are just pretending and they really don't care. We're talking about people who care but can't always muster up the level of caring over and over again, you know, patient after patient after patient. Um, I think it's okay because most of what patients want from us is presence. They want us to be present in the moment with them or in the moments or in the years of their lives. If you're a primary care doctor, you know, they want presence and they want someone to accompany them through this journey. Sometimes it's the no big deal. I have a headache journey. And sometimes it's I'm dying of ALS journey. They want someone to accompany them. And that requires deep and meaningful presence presence, but it doesn't always require genuine caring. And and the reason that I think that it's okay, and again, this is going to be different for different people, but if you're, if you've got a partner, a life partner, there's no way, there is no way over the course of, forget about, you know, a lifetime, 60, 70 years, or, or a couple of decades, or even six months, that every single time you're interacting with that person whom you love deeply, that you actually care about every single thing that they're saying. I mean, and, and it works both ways. As long as my partner is present for me, even if I'm boring the bejesus out of her sometimes, <laughs> or she's got lots of other things she's distracted with, but she can be present with me in the moment and at least listen to what I'm saying, and I can do that for her, it works. It works. That's like a, a healthy lifetime of building a relationship with someone knowing you can rely on them to be there, even if they can't emote with you in exactly the way you're feeling emotional in the moment. And I think it's the same for medicine. Yeah, I think so too. It just makes me think about, like not to put too much of a dark spin on it, but it just makes me think about how truly alone we are in our bodies and our minds and how there's a lot of different ways that we can connect with each other. But 
at the end of the day, if my husband sits me down and he says, you got to listen to this symphony. It's the most gorgeous piece of classical music I've ever heard. <laughs> and I sit down and he plays it for me. And I'm like, this is nice, but this is not really my thing. Like, I can't ever get inside his head or get inside his passion, but right. I can sit there and I can listen. And when it's finished, I can say, thank you so much for sharing. That was really beautiful. Right. I don't know if that's the same as like a patient interaction, but that's just what I thought of. Well, I think the big one of the big differences is that um, that he will reciprocate. When you really want him to sit down and listen to whatever it is that you're in love with that he isn't, he'll do exactly what you did. And you won't necessarily frame his interest in the way that you pretended to care enough. But that reciprocal relationship is, is I think it's, that's what's fundamentally different because the patients, a patient can almost never do that for the doctor, which is what makes it, what's, that's part of what makes it more challenging. We're always the ones who are trying to provide that, that presence, that accompaniment, the caring, if you will, in quotes, to the patient and they and they don't have the um, they don't have the I'm going to say that they don't have the ability to do that but that doesn't mean that they're not able to that means that we don't provide them the opportunity to do that I was thinking about your story and I was thinking to myself, okay, in this scenario, what would caring with a capital C have meant? Maybe it means you get to know his name and get to know his family and just become enmeshed in his life. And then I was thinking to myself, like, that just doesn't seem right either. And sometimes I have this in the hospital where I'll be taking care oh, yeah. of a patient who is homeless and I think to myself, like, oh, I could probably just take them into my home. Mm -hmm. And you examine it and you're like, that's ridiculous because even if I did it once, I couldn't do it for every patient. And so maybe this type of like deep caring where you just throw yourself into somebody's life in a really intense personal way isn't the right path anyway. Maybe. But maybe every once every couple of years for a particular patient who strikes a certain chord in you and you let yourself be completely human with them. And you develop a relationship that's beyond the patient-physician relationship and it helps keep you human, maybe that's enough. Maybe that's enough to keep you connected to the humanity of all of these people who otherwise just want you to be there for them. I don't know. But it also comes with some risks, I think, because the people with whom you have those kinds of connections are often going to be people who are like you, who look like you or remind you of someone you love or sound like you or come from a similar background. And if you're taking care of a, a broad range of patients in terms of socioeconomic status and race and you know sexual orientation, there's a, there's a real risk there of only some people benefiting from those kinds of personal or intimate connections with their doctors and people who aren't represented enough in the field kind of being left at the margins. Which is problematic when you have a predominantly white male heterosexual physician exactly. workforce, but if you had a more diverse physician workforce, then maybe that would be okay. Yeah. So over the course of your career, have you figured out how to be better at caring? I, th I think that as I get older, I become more comfortable with vulnerability, um, with allowing myself to be vulnerable to um, emotions, my own and other people's emotions, and not working as hard to protect myself. And I think it's even starting to be more true in my own life, with my family, with friends. And I think it is linked to a more closely aligned caring about someone and caring for them than a year or two or five years ago. So what I'm hearing is that as you grow older, you're getting more comfortable with who you are and yourself and being vulnerable and kind of relinquishing that authoritative mask of the physician. What is it that makes that vulnerability possible, though? I think it's, it's really 
it feels like it's really complicated because it is it is mixed in with um, the good fortune that I've had, right, to be reasonably successful, and the the confidence sometimes that comes with that. And I don't, I certainly don't mean confidence equals arrogance. I mean confidence, just like I feel, I feel okay in my own skin, and a lot of that comes with obviously with privilege. But when you get to a point in your life where it feels like you're through the first part of your life, at least for me, it feels like I can relax a little bit, take it easy, stop being so self-protective, stop um, worrying so much about saying or doing exactly the right thing, be a little bit more bold. And that feels good. If or when you get to the point where you can do that, you do a lot less squirming you do a lot less pretending. You don't stop squirming, you don't stop pretending, but there's less of it. Well, I can tell you that I've been thinking about this story ever since you performed it. It really gave me a lot to think about and a lot to chew on, and I'm so glad that you shared it with us. So thanks for coming on the show. Thank you, and thanks for creating The Nocturnus. It's really an unbelievable opportunity for people to share these sorts of experiences and learn from them. That's our show. Join us next week for our final episode of Season 3, where I'll be talking to ICU physician Kathy Humakowski about her story, Just Five Minutes. I want to thank executive producer Ali Block, producer and head of story development Adelaide Papazolo, podcast producer Liza Veal, director of operations Rebecca Groves, and communications specialist Cora Becker. Our original artwork is by Lindsay Mound. Our original theme was composed by Yosef Monroe, and additional music is from Blue Dot Sessions. The Nocturnus is made possible by the California Medical Association, the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, and people like you who have donated through our website and Patreon page. Thank you for supporting our work in storytelling. If you'd like to add your voice to one of our future projects, visit our website at thenocturnus.com. And don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review our show. Today is Giving Tuesday. We have an exciting new project coming up in 2021, and we're relying on the support of our listeners to make it all happen. Make a gift at thenocturnist.com slash donate. To hear more true personal stories from healthcare professionals and research scientists, check out Saturday Night Stories from UC San Francisco. Each episode brings you deeply personal stories of the curiosity, inspiration, and sacrifice it takes to solve the most difficult problems in health today. Find Saturday Night Stories from UCSF on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. We are the Nocturnists. We'll be back next week.